am happy to be joined with the CEO of Red Light Hall and Todd Shapiro joins us. Todd, it's been since last summer since we connected. How's things going? Well, Shad, thank you so much for having me. And, and honestly, first off, like congrats. I know that when you started this, we had spoken and, and sort of we were we picked each other's advice on everything, really. Yeah. And uh, it's really nice to see you develop this into something really great. So congrats on all the hard work. Yeah, I appreciate it. And uh, likewise, it seems like, you know, as the industry starts to expand a little bit more, we've had a little bit of a downtime the last couple of months for the overall industry. But for the most part, um, I always like to ask this question to a lot of CEOs. Where's the health of the industry in the direction that you're seeing, knowing that you're a CEO and you get a chance to speak to some obviously well-connected people on a day-to-day -day basis? Yeah, listen, there's a lot of different companies within the psychedelic sector. And, and some of those companies, including ours, have really done very well in terms of raising funds. Yep. So if you look to any new industry or to any stock for that matter that you're looking at investing in, one of the things I would have ever done as a retail investor is look at a company's cash position. What's the runway? And, mm -hmm. and, and what's the motivation behind them growing a very real business? So I would say that some companies who are well-funded generally will last way longer. Uh, Bruce Linton, who's the chair of our advisory board, would, would say something like, when you look at a stock, if it were to go up, say, in, in, in steps and then yep. and keep going, and, and in the times where maybe it's a little, little bit of a lull, that's when the company might be spending the money, creating, doing things, and, and always trying to advance shareholder value. And, and everyone always talks about the stocks, you would say, that you know, go from $0.20 cents to $20. But do they talk about the stocks that go from $0.20 cents to $0? And, and I think the strength is the funds that you have to support the vision. So what inning are we in? Maybe the first, maybe the second as a sector as the whole. Who will get to the ninth inning or even extra innings? I think they're the ones that are cashed up strong. And Red Light Hall, and as of a few days ago, announced we had $31 million in, in cash and cash equivalents. So we think we're well positioned in that manner. You brought up Bruce's name. How has he helped and continue to help, I guess, advance the company? He's a big name. You know, obviously, there's a lot of people. And, you know, we, needless to say, we obviously know his past with Canopy, but um, what are some of the things that you see in a day-to-day -day basis that he opens up possible uh, partnerships for you? Yeah, first off, Bruce is a fascinating guy. I mean, I think he's done pretty well in the industry of cannabis and others. And and I, I'll talk to him on Zoom chats, and he still has like these railings and banisters from 1970. <laughs> yeah. like, Dude, you got <laughs> to get a little modern here, but that just speaks to who Bruce is. Like, <laughs> I... I I, I sort of I get almost emotional because I, I can't believe the amount of support he personally gives me and that he absolutely gives Red Light Holland as a whole and our entire team. So this is a individual who is a worker. I mean, he is committed. He works and he gives us copious amounts of time. I mean, I would say we talk in the last month, for example, I would say that we've talked at least three or four times a week and are probably what's happening each other once a day. So he is extremely committed. Uh, it's not like we're punching in a clock with Bruce at all and trying, yeah, yeah, trying yeah. to figure out what his hours are. But uh, this, you know, this individual is, is really quite phenomenal. I liken it to if you're starting a tech company and Elon Musk would or, or you know, say were to come on as your chair of your advisory board. Um, that's what I liken Bruce to helping Red Light Holland. And, you know, it's a great position with him as the chair of the advisory board. We get to create as advisors. Sometimes if he was just on the board for now, like, you know, that might be a time where you got to really go and be careful with the moving of the forward for yeah. us we're working on creation and i love it what do you think if you look back so far what you've done and being the ceo of this company in the capital markets industry if there's one thing you could point at about what you've learned the most about this role what would it be not to get emotional um I, i'm an emotional creature by habit i'm from the media yep. background and we were trained to be emotional i mean your emotions are what spoken volumes to be captivating and engaging and, and garner audiences whether you're happy you would show that on a exaggerated level and if you're sad if you really could show that genuinely then people you know i think would be engaged so what i would say there shad is that when you're the CEO of a publicly traded company and a rookie CEO for that matter, a lot of people don't realize what goes into behind the scenes, anything from continuous disclosure to yeah. updated MDNAs to, you know, dealing with audits to dealing with your legal teams. There's so dealing with regulatory bodies in this kind of very interesting progressive space that Red Light Holland is involved in the psychedelic sector, of course, but the legal recreational side of the psychedelic sector where we're dealing with consumer goods products and working so carefully with government bodies and stuff. So, um, 
and then you see a stock price go up and down at times and, yeah. and the yeah. day to day doesn't change. So we're, 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 you know, have this vision and we're, we're going directly towards getting it. And I'd like to say that after now a year in, I think the best part and the best thing I've learned is really not to get emotional and just to focus on the plan and hopefully everything follows suit. Well said. Um, want to get into the business fundamentals. You recently announced your I microdose truffle packs are now available. 144% more point. I got to understand what's the difference between 140 and 144, but still it's an accurate number, but the distribution in the Netherlands uh, as previously announced. Uh, so walk me through how sales were growing and how sales, you know, um, continue to develop, I would say in that landscape. Yeah, without a doubt. So when we started this company just over a year ago and we got public about, I guess, eight, nine months ago, um, we, we hadn't ever really produced a product within, within the psychedelic sector. So we carefully, but very quickly and efficiently started a farm. We started mm -hmm. growing magic truffles. We learned how to package them, how to well, harvest them first, package them, and then distribute them. And distributing takes some time. You got to form relationships. You got to get into the smart shops where you could do so in the Netherlands. And we wanted to brand it very well. I'm a brander by trade. Yep. And we did. We branded it out of the gate extraordinarily well. One of the things with COVID is we go, well, it's harder to get door to door. It's harder to get FaceTime with the shop owners. It's harder to get shelf space. So we decided to go and buy a distribution company. And we thought that was a brilliant strategic move for us. And you say a number like 144% more, right? Well, it took us, I guess, a few months to get into nine shops and with only a few weeks of acquiring SR wholesale, which by the way, is vastly into revenues. I mean, I think there are close to 3 million uh, equivalent of Canadian dollars in revenues last year. And this is a business that's been thriving for years now is they have all the relationships. So we went with our team in the Netherlands, and now we've gotten to 13 more stores. So that's accurately 144% more. And right. yes, it takes time to get the product familiar with customers that walk into those stores. But again, we have branded it well, we're selling it like a microdose, which many people don't. So in a way, it's it's a new way of selling magic truffles, many you haven't really ever consumed it that way. Mm -hmm. And we'd like to think that this brand exposure, the store exposure, getting into new stores and knocking these stores down much easier with our relationships from SR Wholesale, that we'll see a, a big advancement, not only in, in brand exposure and, and displacement on shelves, but also potential sales. Do you see growth opportunities on the e-commerce side as well? Like how does it work in the Netherlands for people in a, a legal regulatory framework? Can they buy stuff like that online? Totally. If you go to imicrodose.nl right now, you can buy our microdose packs if you're 18 plus in the Netherlands. You can't buy them outside of the Netherlands. And yeah, there is definitely a marketing strategy that will go into our online sales. I mean, truth be told, we wanted to make sure that we could grow properly, that we could harvest properly, and that we could package and then distribute properly and now ship properly. So it takes time, right? So you don't want to just go and invest call it $100,000 in the marketing if you don't think the fulfillment is a perfect operating machine. And right now we feel that it's much smoother than it would have been had we jumped out of the gate. So I think you'll see Red Light Holland being a little bit more aggressive with their marketing for the purpose of increased sales. And, and that's what we're looking towards doing. And, and listen, with COVID, it also helps getting product right to people's doors. And we're going to be a lot of fun. We're from the radio background, Chad and I. So, yeah. you know, you think of radio promotions. You made more money than marketing. I did, though. <laughs> well, listen, it, 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 you know, a lot of it's luck and timing and a lot of things in life. I don't know if it's necessarily talent. I had a good run for sure, but um, it wasn't a passion of mine. This is a passion yeah. of mine, but the idea of creation, marketing and having fun. Listen, we're in the psychedelic, uh, you know, yeah. psilocybin, magic truffle, magic mushroom business. It's phenomenal for me to be here. And I can't wait to work with our team to have these fun promotional campaigns going out to, again, to help drive back to revenues and increase sales. Well, you understand, obviously, branding, social influencing, big names. Uh, you've obviously done that with Russell Peters, um, Tony Clement, obviously, uh, uh, Bruce Linton. So what is the branding strategy in a, in a country like the Netherlands that, you know, uh, is Russell, you know, considered a big name over there like he is here in North America? Like, does he help advance the company or what is the overall strategy within, uh, you know, that landscape? Yeah, very good question. So we do have a unique strategy. I'm actually going to hold it um, 
I'm going to hold it close to me right now because it's, it's, I don't, it's a competitive industry still, right? So, so our unique marketing strategy is about to launch here. We're, we're working carefully on some really unique yep. ideas to get product into people's homes. Uh, but the main strategy right now really is SR Wholesale and the distribution networks and open up as many smart shops as possible. And regarding Russell Peters, listen, Russell is an absolute rock star when it comes to being a entrepreneur. And a lot of people just think of the name Russell Peters as a very funny stand-up guy, as a couple of bits they'll try to do his impression on and and maybe some voices and cartoons that he's done in the past but what russell did better than anybody else is the fact that he owned his own business he and his brother were their own entities they were the company behind the russell peter stage show and by that I mean, Russell is not only just our chief creative officer, but he sits down with us with strategies on how to be more revenue focused on how to make money. Russell was in charge of all his own ticketing. Was Can, you in give me all his own Can you maybe give me an example of some of the stuff that he provides feedback? Yeah. So one of the things Russell really wants to do is be genuine. You can't shake the genuine and authentic nature out of Russell Peters. So part of the frustration is Russell just doesn't want to go on Joe Rogan's podcast and be like, yeah, man, magic truffles are the greatest thing. It helped me with this. It helped me with that. He hasn't done them yet because he hasn't been able to get to the Netherlands. They're not taking people mm. who live in America over into Europe. Right. So the whole idea with Russell is to do these very genuine appearances at some point, consume the magic truffles together, dot document what we're going to do together. Um, let him explain to us in his own words, because we can't make medical claims as a company, but anybody within the company anecdotally can tell you how it affects them. And for me personally, I'm a very anxious guy. I have no problem admitting that. Um, it helps me control my anxiety. Russell has publicly spoken about, and he did it on that big city TV documentary, talk yeah. about how he suffers from a great deal of depression and stuff, even though the guy's probably worth, you know, I don't know if he wants to be saying this, but a lot of money. And, 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 you know, so sometimes people way success and money is the keys to success. Dealing with yourselves is the key to success and how you feel on the day to day. There's far bigger issues than just us worrying about money and things. So it's really about how you're feeling mentally. So I'm excited for Russell to try yeah. the product and Russell will get really involved. And in the meantime, listen, he drops our name on podcast. He helped us get on the city TV documentary. He is a big name and a big celebrity. You know, he shares a lot of our tweets. He shares a lot of our posts on Instagram stories. And that does really help with a lot of exposure and brand recognition, which is half the battle. One of the things I want to learn um, about, and this is an interesting question I've reached out to a few people, you announced recently import shipment of truffles from Netherlands into Canada. So it's legalized, obviously, in the Netherlands. It's not legalized, obviously, here in Canada. What happens to that shipment when it arrives into a country of Canada? Is it, are they legal? Can they be consumed? Do they go into a laboratory for research? Maybe walk us through in our viewers just an understanding as to how that whole process works. Without a doubt. So first off, when we started this company called Red Light Hall, and I think it was a bit polarizing for some, and that's because I'm a brander and I like, I like the polarizing nature. I like the fact that it creates hype and talk. And I think a lot of people never truly imagined that we would be doing things that nobody else in the entire world has done. I mean, trailblazing. And these are huge milestones, massive milestones that we've accomplished at Red Light Holland. So we got, think about this, a consumer goods product with mm -hmm. psilocybin in it, magic truffles. Yep. Get to Canada through legal measures, right. international borders. It got from the Netherlands to Canada because of a psilocybin import license. We work with Seacrest Laboratories and we also work with Shaman Pharma. So how does this work? Well, it works very carefully working within the governments, applying for the proper permits, et cetera. But it also works because we want to show the market that this company is very serious about potential expanding markets. So to answer your question right now, no, this can't be used for sale that it's in Canada, but what it can be done is test within Seacrest Laboratories. We can look for certain compounds within it. We can maybe look to the government to say, hey, we've gotten this batch in there. Can we potentially get bigger batches into Canada? And of course, Shad, I'd be lying if I wouldn't tell you that we're trying to show everyone that we're using these very careful corporate governance combined with regulatory frameworks and the authorities to show that we can do this legally while, while so many other companies, and, and, and it kind of pisses me off, to be honest, just don't 
care for the law. You're seeing a lot of illegal sales of microdose packs all, ac all across Canada. You're seeing people post them on their Instagrams. You're seeing Instagram accounts from companies that, quite frankly, I think are selling a bunch of them. And, and they're doing it illegally. And what happened with cannabis? Well, the companies that were doing it illegally, as they went into a legal framework of cannabis, they got shut down. They got the cement blocks put in front of them. you see that happening again in this framework, yeah, in this industry? Yeah. It, 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 you know, I can't make a prediction that it will happen, but we're starting to see the patterns, Chad, that it potentially could. And what are those patterns? Well, it's a similar path, the path that cannabis paved to become legal, which was one, it was allowed for terminally ill. Back yep. in 2001, that's exactly what cannabis, it was a prescriptive model and could be used for those who are terminally ill, people at AIDS, et cetera. And now what we're seeing with psilocybin and magic mushrooms, not a synthetic product, but the natural occurring raw product itself has been prescribed by our health minister. It's been allowed for use for those who have terminally ill and those right. with severe trauma. And now they're using it for those who are being trained who are psychotherapists and, 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 and just uh, within the, the, the psychiatric care. So so that to us sets an example that maybe one day they will allow, because listen, I get that someone with severe trauma should use magic mushrooms, in my opinion, but does that mean that someone who just has a little bit of trauma shouldn't be able to be allowed that access? So we're trying to work with the governments in this critical path in a very careful way, say we got our product here, we're um, you know using it and selling it, and we're getting great feedback in terms of how people feel about it, and maybe we could then be a part of the process to prescribe it to people in Canada as well, if it ever becomes legal that way. Well, yeah, your play is a lot more in the recreational versus medicinal. What's some of the feedback that you hear, you know, here in North America? Is that realistic? Like many people I've spoken to, like, what's your response if somebody says, no way, not going to happen if it does long time down the road? What's your response to that? Yeah, my response to that is there's a mental health crisis going on right now. And my response to that is there's a social movement going on right now. And so can we make medical claims yet? No, we're not allowed to. But can we listen to the people? And the people are using magic mushrooms everywhere. They're using magic truffles everywhere. So again, it's about the legalities of how you approach this. And at some point is Canada or maybe even America, and we're seeing it within Oregon now, with yeah. Measure 109 being written, are they going to look towards thinking, well, people are using these substances anyway. Do not group drugs. You can't group a magic mushroom with cannabis. You can't group a magic truffle with heroin. Don't say that all drugs have these similar properties because they don't. And what the science is showing and the people doing the hard legwork, by the way, the big science plays and of course, FDA breakthrough therapies, et cetera, within psilocybin, we're seeing so many positive results. So we think that coupled with the social movements will allow for a much more progressive government approach to potentially maybe not legalize it like we're seeing with cannabis, but potentially a prescriptive model where you would go in, get a doctor, prescribe you, call it the I microdose pack that then you would go pick up at a dispensary or maybe your doctor would have it themselves so you would so that's maybe a more likely approach so sorry to interrupt you chad but you know you think like cannabis went medical first in canada and then legal recreationally in a way it's just a bit backwards because we're working within a legal framework in the netherlands that's legal and recreational now but it doesn't mean that that's the path for it to be, get to the market maybe it's more of that medical side it's almost recreational first and then medical second well the requirements that are going to be needed if you pivot from a medicinal side would be research. So um, where does that leave you if you're focusing a lot on recreational and, you know, the data that obviously needs to be provided with government officials when it comes to a lot of the research? Yeah, so that you might have seen that I announced, uh, I guess it was a couple of months ago already, that we were looking to set up shop in St. Vincent, St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Okay. And we were working with a company called Mirror Life Sciences, who have one of the psychedelic licenses with a very progressive government for research and development centers. So I was spent a significant amount of time in St. Vincent recently. I only left because of the volcano, quite frankly. And uh, maybe this is a good time for me just to touch on that for a moment, because it's a very tough time in St. Vincent. And they are focused on recovery and rebuild. It's a very strong nation of beautiful, hardworking people, very intelligent, and just very kind and friendly. So yeah. the government doing a phenomenal job on rebuilding St. Vincent. We've set up the St. Vincent SVG Strong campaign. We launched it earlier on Friday. And the key to that campaign is helping with the rebuild. And Red Light Holland is really getting a big way behind that. And we'd love for people to go to www.svg.com 
strong.org to see how you could donate. And we have like all these government sureties of where the money's going and letters of recommendation. It's not one of these, like, you know, it's a very trustworthy, great charity. And we're yeah. excited about that. Cause to be honest, I'm very skeptical about charities. I like, I had to put my foot down that I knew where every dollar was going and we do. And back to the business side of it, it delayed some of the talk, some of the due diligence with mirror life sciences. And of course the government has to focus on creating the psychedelic industry with regs and policies. So that is still happening. I would say that the talks are productive and getting back to your question that you asked me, this is a big part of our research and development strategy. So hopefully we can figure out a way to get, you know, maybe, you know, I, I gotta be careful, obviously on, on, I don't want to mislead anybody, but you know, the goal is and the intentions are to, to, you know, have a research and development facility at some point. So investors can anticipate that ongoing talks will continue obviously once, uh, you know, there's obviously more pressing issues right now. I think that's the safest way to put it. And, and with that being said, talks, believe it or not, are still going on more through WhatsApp and more through email. Yeah. Uh, but I want to give the government some patience. The last thing I want to do is force their hand on this issue. Next month, a Thai Life Sciences goes public. There's been a lot of speculation about this could really uh, create another renaissance for the industry. What's your thoughts on it all? Yeah, I don't really care about our competitors that much. Um, I'm focused on driving a business that's focused on revenues. A lot of these sort of science plays, I don't necessarily know are focused on current revenues or focused on long-term development and then long-term exit strategy to like a Johnson and Johnson and a big pharma company. So yeah, is it great? Yeah, it's, it's, it's amazing. The more attention, the better, I think. But again, the same way I would say, don't group all drugs together. I don't think we necessarily need to group all psychedelic companies together in one sector. If it draws attention to us, that's phenomenal. With that being said, I plan on drawing attention to us just by the business that we're doing on hand. Well said. Listen, I know you're busy. Let's keep in touch. I like the new logo as well. Thanks, man. Okay, so merch is coming out like I literally think today or tomorrow, um, we've designed these really cool, like, listen, I'm a brander and people joke, oh, merch hat company. Listen, there's a lot of money to be made on merch. So don't take that for granted. No, there and, isn't. Uh, look, at, look at OVO, for example, who I'm wearing. I mean, Drake obviously crushes it with his music and, and, yeah. and you know making money touring, but he makes a shit ton selling clothes as well. So never yeah. ignore the clothing. And it's a movement. Red Light Holland is the people's company. We stand for access now. We want to be of help and assistance without making the medical claim. We want to hear from you. You know, Shad, we never even got into the tech that we've developed from our digital care program app that is really unlike no others because it's got body predictive movement data within it. We have a digital counts. We have a counselor through a telecounseling health program on that digital care app. We have virtual reality headsets when you go into smart shops that help you understand what psilocybin and microdosing is, meaning that if you're not comfortable with it, we actually recommend you not to buy the product. Uh, we're doing very, very, very awesome things in the science and innovation uh, realm. And sorry for being long-winded, but I couldn't help but ignore that because we're very excited. And the Wisdom Truffle, I'll just leave it at this. Go to wisdomtruffle.com and wait till you see what we're going to come with. Uh, come out with by the end of Q4 uh, designed by Karim Rashid, where imagine the Shad, you're away from your family, your loved ones, and a lot of us are right now. They have a wisdom truffle, which is think of like a cause-like figure, but with digital hardware within it. And you could put it to the heartbeat of someone you loved through an app on your phone and your wisdom truffle, think of a lamp and a cool little truffle mushroom shape that yeah. looks very cute and alive. You would see the heartbeat of your loved one from a distance. And we really want to connect people by disconnecting to your phones and connect people by living in an eye microdose lifestyle, which is living in the moment and trying to enjoy life better. And it's a tough time right now. And I hope everyone's doing okay. Good stuff. We'll have to have you on to learn more about that, but I appreciate you taking the time. Let's keep in touch. Yeah, man, I can't thank you enough. This really means a lot. So thanks yeah, for your time. You're welcome. Thanks, Todd. Appreciate it.